We're going to pray, and then we're going to dive right into what I have for you guys today. So to Jesus, we just thank you <clears throat> for this morning, God, Lord. We thank you for the chains that have already been broken, Lord, and the people who have already been set free just through worship alone, Father. Lord, so we hand the rest of this service over to you, Lord. Will you just use me as your instrument, God, Lord? Will you shut my mouth and just begin to speak the words that you have for your people here this morning? Lord, we just give everything over to you in this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, so we've been in this series of Jesus stories for a while now, and I wanted to open up mine um, just in Matthew chapter 17. So Matthew 17 verse 20 says, Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it'll move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So just with this quick thing, what we see is Jesus is telling his disciples just how powerful faith is can be, and faith is this thing that can open blind eyes, it's this thing that can move a mountain from here to there, and the beautiful thing is Jesus says it only takes a small amount of faith to be able to do this. Throughout all the stories we've talked about so far, I believe it's all come out of this same act, and it's this act of faith, and so what I want to talk to you guys about today is just that thing, and it's faith. I want to talk to you guys about what I'm calling radical faith or dangerous faith. And when I say dangerous faith, I don't mean in a way that it can hurt you, but I mean in a way kind of like how Rob Price is a danger behind the grill or Glenn is a danger in the kitchen or LeBron James or Michael Jordan is a danger on the court. Like when you get this thing in you and you step forth in it, it's going to change lives and people are going to notice something and it's going to be something super amazing and spectacular. So the question is, how do we get that kind of faith? Where is it built? out of and how do we keep it even in the hardest times? And these are going to be the things we talk about today. We're going to be in Mark chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 5. In Mark chapter 5, we're introduced to a synagogue leader and his name is Jairus. And he's a synagogue leader in the town of Capernaum. And here's the beautiful thing about this story. So basically, Jesus and all of his friends and his boys are heading back to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum has become pretty much the central hub of Jesus's ministry. Everyone in Capernaum has seen miracles, they've heard about Jesus, or they've actually seen him do stuff, and so it's become a very beautiful and powerful thing. But then we're introduced to a man named Jairus, and here's the thing about Jairus, as a synagogue leader, he had very simple duties. He was to set the temple up for the services, he would read from the Torah, but also one of his services where he would go to the people's houses and pray for them when they were sick, or they were ill, or they needed something. But the thing with Jairus is he was the person that did this, but what happens when it's your own daughter or your old family that needs prayer? Who do you turn to? You see, the people in the town, they knew they could turn to Jairus in this time, but for him, who did he have? And Jairus had a problem because we find out in Mark chapter 5 that his daughter is severely ill. And so let's just pick it up right here. So Mark chapter 5, verse 21. When Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side... A large crowd gathered around him while he was by sea. One of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, My little daughter is dying. Come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. So Jesus went with him, and a large crowd was following and pressing against him. Now a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years had endured much under many doctors. She had spent everything she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she had become worse. Having heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes, for she said, if I can just touch his clothes, I will be made well. And instantly her flow of blood ceased, and she sensed in her body that she was healed of her inflictions. At once, Jesus recognized in himself that power had gone out from him, and he turned to the crowd and he said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing against you, and yet you say, who touched me? But he was looking around to see who had done this. The woman with fear and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell before him and told him the whole truth. Daughter, he said to her, because of your faith has saved you, go in peace and be healed from your afflictions. While he was still speaking, people from the synagogue leader's house came and said, your daughter is dead, why bother the teacher anymore? When Jesus overheard this, what was said, he told the synagogue leader, he said, don't be afraid, only believe. You see, the opposite of faith is fear, is it not? 
So we come to this point to where (laughs) he's at the lowest moment of his life. He doesn't know where else to turn. He's scared. He's trembling. And we're going to talk about this, but also in this moment, Jairus is feeling like he did not receive what he prayed for. He did not receive what he asked Jesus for. He needed Jesus to come and heal his daughter, yet in this moment, she's dead. So what do we do? What do we hold on to? There's three things about faith that I get from this story and three things that I want to share with you guys when it comes to radical faith or dangerous faith. And the first one is super simple and super easy, but it's that radical faith comes from a place of surrender. Radical faith comes from a place of surrender. You see, the core element of faith is surrender. For some people, they don't believe this, but even Jesus told his disciples, listen, if you want to follow me, you have to say no to yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. It's a daily thing of repentance. It's a daily thing of surrender. It's not a one-time thing, and I say it's daily because there's always something new to surrender to him each day, is there not, church? A.W. Tozer said it this way. He said, faith, as Paul saw it, was a living, flaming thing leading to surrender and obedience to the commandments of Christ. We see in the story that Jairus at this time, he's just a synagogue leader. As a synagogue leader, like I said, he was in charge of a lot of things, and he was one of these people who was leading the church, and as a synagogue leader, he could also be placed in this group of people who didn't so much like Jesus. He could be placed in these group of people that Jesus actually sometimes would talk about, and he would be placed in these group of people who truly didn't believe what Jesus was doing, and he was placed in this group of people who even kind of wanted to just get rid of Jesus. Yet, In the opening of our stories, we see him bowing and eating the dirt at Jesus' feet, begging for a miracle. You see, Jairus had tried everything for his daughter. He went to the doctors. He prayed. He tried healers. Nothing was working. And then he heard Jesus was coming back into the city. And he said, Jesus can do this. And so he casted everything aside just to kneel at the feet of Jesus and ask for something. For Jairus, some things that he had to cast aside was his pride. If Jairus was caught, pretty much, I believe, if Jairus was caught talking to Jesus, he could lose his job. He sacrificed his job. He sacrificed his money. He sacrificed a lot of things just to have this opportunity for Jesus to walk with him to his house so he could see Jesus do something miraculous in his life. In church, this is the beauty of sacrifice because sometimes we have to lay down our pride and sometimes we have to lay down our fears to get to Jesus to be able to allow him to do something in us because honestly, if we're just holding on to it and we're trying to control it on our own, Jesus can't do anything to it because you have such a tight grasp on your problem and you're trying to do it on yourself. Listen, I said this just a couple weeks weeks ago, but life is almost like a game. And what happens is, is we get caught trying to play our own game and we get caught just trying to build up the levels on our own. But what happens when you're stuck in that level that you can't get past? What happens when you're stuck at that level and you realize that you can't do it on your own and Jesus is off to the side just going, listen, pass me the sticks and watch me take you to that next level of where you need to go because I can do it. But we're too busy just trying to play our own game, church. (laughs) Jesus is saying, listen, just give me control. Just give me control. Let me take it. I get it. It's hard. We all like to control and control our own things, but Jesus is here and he's like, listen, just surrender it to me. You see it all throughout the Bible. People are asked to sacrifice, they're asked to surrender. For Moses to be a good leader, he had to set aside his pride and he also had to set aside his fear just so that he could stand once again before Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Abraham set aside literally his love and his fear when Jesus asked him to sacrifice his own son. Yet, he did it anyway. Well, he didn't kill him, but he made it all the way up there. (laughs) We're called to a place of sacrifice. There was a pastor in Romania in the 1940s by the name of Richard Wormbred. He was leading a church during the time that communism was coming in, and one Sunday they were leading a service, and he was asking the people who would stand up when the communists come in, and nobody stood. 
his wife would then turn to Richard and she would say, Richard, you're the one that needs to stand up. You're the one that needs to fight back. And he looked at her and he said, listen, if I stand up to them, you're going to be a widow. And she told him straight up, I would rather be a widow than married to a coward. Don't ever say that to me. Um, <clears throat> I'm just kidding. Sometimes it takes a strong woman to push you in that faith. You know what I'm saying? So Wormwood stood up to them. He was arrested and he was thrown in jail. He was sentenced to solitary confinement, so he was by himself. But what he ended up doing was he ended up preaching the gospel by Morris Code by tapping on the jail cells to the people next to him. What? The communists found out about this. They arrested him again, sentenced him to another like 25 years, and they ended up torturing him and beating him just for his faith. And what happened is Richard would go on to write a book called Tortured for Christ. After he was released out of prison, him and his wife would then start a foundation that ended up helping churches that were going through the same thing that they were potentially going through. But I tell you Richard Wormwood's story to just tell you this, because I believe his story demonstrates something that I've always believed, and that's simply this, that faith is not demonstrated on the platforms, but it's demonstrated in the trenches. Faith can be easy when you're up on the mountaintops and faith can be easy when you're up on that platform, but what happens when you hit the lowest of the lows and you're asking God to move in your life because you honestly have nowhere else to go? Here's Richard in jail. Here's Richard physically getting beat, and yet this is what he tells people. He said, I was able to meet with God in these jail cells in ways that I could never describe. And not even the cell walls or the guards could break my nearness to God or the presence of God in my life in this moment. Listen, church, this is true faith. It comes from saying, God, I can't do this on my own anymore. It comes from saying, like, listen, like, I've tried everything. You're my only hope. Literally take it from me because when I try it on my own, I just fail. Like, bro, just take the sticks. Jesus, take control. Jairus, not just Jairus, but when you talk about this side character in the story and you look at the lady with bleeding disorder, she also had the same problem. And while she had nowhere else to turn, she tried all the doctors, she tried all the healers. And what did she have to do to get healed? She physically had to cast herself aside. Let's talk about this lady for one second. According to Jewish laws, if you had a bleeding disorder, you were unclean. You weren't allowed in the city. You weren't allowed to touch people because if you touched somebody, they were unclean. She wasn't supposed to be in the city. She wasn't supposed to be pushing through a crowd of people, yet she did it anyway because she said, Jesus is the only thing that can heal me. And so while she pushed through everybody, all these people are looking at her going, ew, now I'm unclean. But she didn't care. She showed up on the scene to get to Jesus. She wasn't playing games. She didn't come to the center just to play like patty cake with herself. She didn't come to the center for like physical exercise or whatever we'll be doing during worship. She came because she knew she had a problem and Jesus was the only answer to that problem. So she pushed through a whole crowd of people just to touch the clothes of Jesus because she said that's the only thing that's going to heal me. And because of that faith, she was healed. And that's the beauty of Surrender Church. The beauty of surrender is when you give it up, Jesus takes control. And when Jesus takes control, something crazy happens. I love what Jesus says to Jairus because Jairus is like, bro, just please come to my house and heal my daughter. And Jesus' simple answer is, yeah, bro, let's go. Jesus acts on faith. And it doesn't take a lot of it. Radical faith comes from a place of surrender. One, it comes from a place of surrender. But two, check us out, church. This is where it gets hard. Radical faith is strengthened slash built in the waiting room. Hoo-hoo. Listen, sometimes it can be easy to give it all up to God. Sometimes it can be easy to say, God, take control of my life. But what happens when we get caught in the waiting room and we're waiting on our answer? Because let's, let's be honest, church. We're not patient people. We're not. I prayed for patience once and like eight YouTube ads came up before my video. It was scary. I didn't like it. Okay? Never pray for it. It Like I said, it can be easy to get past the first step, but what happens when we get tested in this waiting room? We see in the story with Jairus that as as he's following Jesus to his house, as he's leading Jesus to his miracle, and I think the beautiful thing of Jairus' story is Jairus is just trying to take a short trip. He's trying to get from where Jesus was to his house, but what happens in the middle of his story? They're stopped. And Jairus gets caught in this weird 
waiting period while Jesus tries to perform another miracle for him. How long can you wait for your miracle? And honestly, that's the mark of maturity. Children, of course, (laughs) have a hard time waiting. They have not learned the difference between no and not yet, because if you tell them not yet, they think that means it's not going to happen. But as we get older, we learn that that's not the case. Spiritual maturity is the ability to wait. Faith is waiting for the answer, understanding that sometimes that answer is delayed because, listen, church, in God's plan, timing is so crucial. God's timing is so important, and many times we can be praying for the right thing, but it may not just be the right time. For a lot of us, though, we we like to try and put ourselves ahead of God's timing, or sometimes we'll be behind God's timing, but the perfect place to be is right on time with God, because God's timing is a perfect and beautiful thing for every single part of your life. God's timing is going to be perfect in your marriage. God's timing is going to be perfect with your children. God's timing is going to be perfect with your job or your education because that's who he is. He is a perfect and loving God. But sometimes we get trapped in the processes of the waiting room, waiting on our answer, and honestly, we just go crazy because we're so impatient and we just want it here and we want it now. There's two ways that I believe Jairus could have potentially (laughs) reacted in his waiting room. One way, so like I said, Jairus is trying to get Jesus from where he was to his house to heal his daughter, but they're stopped when someone touches out to Jesus for a miracle. Jairus can either, one, be that guy who's off to the side, frustrated and angry, going, come on, 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 what are you doing? Like, bro, we we were going to my miracle, we were, we were going to my daughter. It was my daughter who was sick. Honestly, this woman shouldn't even be in the city. Why is she here? Why are you talking to her? Because now you're uncleaned and that's gross. Like, bro, it's supposed to be about me. We were heading to me. And what happens is when we get this mindset, church, we're trying to get God to do a God thing on man's time. And that's a dangerous place to be because we just talked about how God's timing is perfect and everything. And when you're so focused on trying to get God to do something on your timetable, you're once again saying you're in control of the situation. And then we have to go back to step one, do we not? (laughs) It's hard. The second thing he could have done, which is what I hope Jairus did, or kind of how I like to try and I vision myself in the waiting room, but it's super hard is sometimes when we're waiting on our miracle, when we're waiting on the thing that we ask God for, we start to see other people receive miracles. And when other people start to receive miracles, we can get jealous, we can get angry, or we can worship and we can praise and we can be excited for them because what is happening in them can also happen in us. And I'm hoping that this is exactly what happened with Jairus. And as Jairus is trying to get to his miracle, he stopped. And maybe for the first time in his life, he's probably heard the stories about Jesus, but maybe for the first time in his life, he's actually seeing Jesus heal somebody. And this can rejuvenate you and it can get you so excited and on fire for your miracle because you're like, oh my goodness, if Jesus can heal this unclean woman who's been bleeding for 12 years, he can definitely heal my daughter who's been ill for just a little bit of time. And here's the beautiful thing about God's timing, church. Check this out. (laughs) How old was Jairus' daughter? How old was Jairus' daughter? She was 12. How many years was this lady bleeding? 12 years. So, if my math is correct, it sometimes isn't. 12 years before this, this woman contracted a bleeding disorder and Jairus' daughter was born. Also that 12 years later, Jesus could show up on the scene and perform two miracles and receive all the honor and glory and power within that. This woman who for 12 years was bleeding, was unclean, was dealing with so much and was praying for a miracle and tried everything she could to happen, she got healed at the exact moment, at the exact time that probably encouraged Jairus to keep pushing forward because of what was about to happen next. Sometimes the timing in your life isn't for you, but it may be for other people. 
God may be having you wait on a miracle, and it may not be for you, but it may be for somebody else. Come on, church. So how do we respond in the waiting room, man? This is one of my favorite stories. So in Mark chapter 10, you don't have to turn to this if you don't want to, but in Mark chapter 10, um, I think it was James and John. James and John come up to Jesus, and they basically ask him for something, and Jesus is like, hey, what do you want? And they're like, hey, bro, we just want to sit at the right hand of you like when we go up to heaven. Like we want to be right there next to you. Can we do that? And Jesus' response to them is like, bro, you have no idea what you're asking for. Like, this is extremely difficult. It's going to be a hard road. And then Jesus basically says, listen, that's also not even mine to give you, so you're just not going to get it. Like, I'm sorry. Like, that's not mine to give. A couple verses later, Jesus shows up. Or I'm sorry, a couple verses later, they're still following Jesus, and they come face to face with a blind man. And Jesus asks the blind man the same question. He's like, what do you want? And he says, I just want to see. So Jesus gives him his miracle and he's able to see again. And here's what the Bible says in Luke. Um, Same story, but this is how Luke writes it. I think we have it on the screen. So basically what happens is, (laughs) here's how Luke says it. He says, after Jesus heals his sight, everyone rejoices. Everyone begins praising. Everyone in the vicinity starts lifting up a shout of praise and honor for God. There it is. Instantly he could see, and he began to follow him, glorifying God All the people, when they saw this, gave praise to God. All the people includes James and John, who didn't receive their miracle, who didn't receive what they asked for. Yet here they are praising God for a miracle that he just did. What do we do in the waiting room, church? We praise, we worship, and we continue to honor God for what he's doing, maybe not just in our lives, but other people's lives as well. The waiting room is a place of worship, and it's a place of praise. I know the waiting room is hard. I'm not a patient person. You can ask my wife, I'm horrible at this. It's not my strong suit. I don't like waiting. When I ask for an answer, I like want it there. I want it now. I need the miracle in my life now and in this moment. But like I said, having that mindset and putting myself ahead of God and saying that I know better for me than he does is a dangerous place to live in. So radical faith comes from a place of surrender. Radical faith is built in the waiting room. And the third point, and I think one of the hardest, is this, and that's radical faith is trusting God even if I don't get it. Radical faith is trusting God even if I don't get it. What happens when we prayed? What happens if we did all we could? What happens when we worship through the waiting room and yet it still didn't come. What do we do? This is a hard one. In the story, we technically see that Jairus didn't get what he asked for. Jairus has asked Jesus to pretty much come to his house and heal his daughter. Yet in this moment, someone is coming up to him and saying, bro, she's dead. In this moment, Jairus' heart just breaks. In this moment, he feels defeated. In this moment, he feels like he just lost everything in the world. And he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know where to go. His friend who came up to him to tell him that he's dead pretty much just tells him, hey, just leave Jesus alone. Like, let's just go back. Jesus, who is eavesdropping on this conversation, who is the only person who's allowed to eavesdrop on conversations, (laughs) speaks up and tells him what, church? Don't fear, but... Don't fear, but... There we go. Believe. There's our answer. When we end up in this spot where we're asking for it doesn't happen, we have to respond just with more faith. Faith is this understanding that God is in control and not me. We already said it, but the Bible says this, and it says basically that God's ways are better than my ways, as his thoughts 
are better than my thoughts. And honestly, church, who am I to fight against the will of God? If God says this thing isn't right for me, who am I to say he's wrong? If we're going to believe everything we've talked about today and we're going to believe everything that we've been talking about literally over this past year or whatever, then we got to stand and firm and trust God that he is who he says he is. Honestly, God is omnificent, which means he knows past, present, and future. And here we are just living in the present, trying to understand everything that's going on around us. What I love about God is God, from the beginning of me being created, he had everything written out. He knew my, he knew my beginning and he knew my end. Yet here's Corey just living in the present, trying to figure it all out, and it doesn't make sense at all. And as I continue to pray for countless of things throughout my life, a lot of them honestly didn't come true. And I had no idea why. I had no idea why these things were happening to me. And I was just left with questions and I was left with trying to understand it. And some things I still don't understand. Some things did come to light to me. And I'll share some of those with you guys in just a minute. But here's what I want to tell you guys. When it comes to trusting God, when it comes to having this kind of faith, we just have to believe in the promises that he gave us. When we get to these trenches moments and we sometimes don't get what we ask for, or we've been praying so hard and these things don't happen or we still end up getting sick or we still end up losing a loved one, sometimes we just have to stand on the promises of God. Two promises I want to give you guys real quick. One is that God has a plan for my life. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. There you go. He tells us plain out. He has a plan for us. Those plans are good. They're plans of hope, not for disaster. Your future is supposed to be hopeful. It's not supposed to be dreadful. And how can we believe this? How can we stand on the promises of God? Check this out. We can do that because God can be trusted because Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promises. Listen, church, God is a promise keeper. And if he promised me a life full of hope and not disaster, I just have to trust him and walk in that, believing that everything that is happening is potentially happening for a reason. And there's gonna be a pretty good outcome for it. It's what we get to hold on to in these times. We get to hold on to that God is a loving God who knows what we need and he will give us these things according to his will. And honestly, it comes out of a, it comes out of a place of contentment. It comes out of a place of contentment. You see Paul all throughout the New Testament. And honestly, I can stand up here and preach on contentment for a whole another hour. I'm not going to do that to you guys. I'm going to leave that for another sermon for another day. But Paul all throughout the Bible tells the people in all of his letters that, listen, nothing matters except for Jesus. Paul is sitting in a jail cell physically telling people, it doesn't matter if I'm hungry. It doesn't matter if I'm full. It doesn't matter if I have money. It doesn't matter if I'm broke. Honestly, it doesn't matter if they kill me tomorrow because I draw my joy and peace and love from Jesus himself. That's what it means to be contempt. It means that Jesus is all I need. It means that Jesus is all I'll ever want. And I want to be honest with you guys because that's what I love to do more than anything other than tell stories is I like to be honest with you guys on my life. And I hit this place of contentment, honestly, at our last encounter night here at the church, which wasn't that long ago. I shared with you guys a couple years ago a conversation I had with Jesus and it happened three years ago at church camp. And Jesus asked me three simple questions of faith when it came to trusting him. And the first thing he asked me was, can I trust him with my ministry? And back then that was super easy because they're teenagers. Like, I honestly don't want to control them anyway. So God, you take them. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's all you. You're in control. You do what you want. I'm going to step back and just be the beautiful face. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's what I do best, baby. My wife said amen. All right, so um, she said, yeah, you are. Anyways, so super simple, super easy. The second thing he asked me for, and this is when it got difficult, he said, you okay? He said, you can trust me with your ministry, but do you trust me with your wife? And I said, ooh. (laughs) 
That one took a while, and honestly, it took the beginning of this year to be able to tell God yes to that. For those who don't know, Mackenzie suffers with migraines, and it's actually something really hard. And for the past eight, how, eight years I've known you? We're going to go with eight years. You're looking at me weird. Nine years. Thank you. For the past nine years, we've been, we've been doing this. For the past nine years, I've known about these. And for the past nine years, I stood in the place and tried to control the situation. So like when we would go on trips, I would make sure she had everything she needed. I would make sure we weren't out in the sun too long because I knew what would trigger these migraines. And so I did everything I could to try to make sure these things weren't popping up and that we were seeing doctors, that we were doing what we were supposed to do to try and stop these things. And man, that burden got heavy. I love you. (laughs) But when you try and control something on your own, it gets hard and it gets heavy to carry around. The beginning of this year, I had like some of my own medical problems and I hit a point to where I was like, I can't do both. Like, it's stressful, it's fun. Marriage, they said. Anyways, in this moment at the beginning of the year, we were praying together, and um, man, I just said, God, it's, it's you. I said, take it. I said, what happens with her at this point? I said, it's, on, it's up to you. I said, if we get answers this year, that's you. If we don't get answers this year, that's fine. We may never get answers, but whatever. God's in control of it now. And like, I wiped my hands clean of that puppy, and I said, it's you, God, take it. This year, we went through a lot of testing for it. This year, we did a lot of things to try and get an answer for it. And we haven't gotten anything back almost just yet. We've gotten super close, and we're almost there. But the beauty is, is God is in control of it now. The third thing he asked me for, and this is where it gets super fun and super hard, is God asked me if I trusted him with my kids. And three years ago, I looked at him, and I was like, what, what kids? We ain't got no kids. And he said, yeah, but even if you don't, do you still trust me? Also three years ago, we were told that it would be super hard to have children. It wasn't going to be impossible. It was just going to be hard. And I said, why would you hit me with a low blow like that? (laughs) At the last encounter night, I was on my knees and I was praying. And I looked up. And I saw something beautiful. God showed me in that instant everything he's given me in my life. Other than the fact that he created me, he died for me, he loved me, even like through the worst of my worst, that alone, those three things is alone to give him honor, give him praise, and give him glory. But then you tack on the blessings that he threw in my life on top of that. (laughs) When I looked up, I got to see my beautiful wife, who was always by my side, who was always standing behind me no matter what. I was reminded of the friends and the extra family he's given me all throughout my life, who has been there for me, supported me, and stood for me. My own family, who has always been there, who has always done what they were supposed to be. And then I looked up and I got to see my church family, who honestly, you guys have been behind me 100% every step of the way. And I love that. And I honor that. And it has been amazing and a beautiful thing. And when I looked up and God started showing me all these things, I said, you know what? If this is it for me, bro, it's enough. It's enough. I said, this is all the blessings you want to give me in my life, man. It's more than enough. Tack on the fact that he died for me. Bro, that in itself is enough. But you tack on the blessings and the bonuses he threw on top of my life. It's enough. God is in control, not me. If God doesn't want a certain thing in my life, it's probably for my good. It's funny how these things can happen. So some of the things I prayed for growing up that ended up turning out to be good. Um, when I was little, my, my parents got divorced and I can remember praying so hard for that not to happen. And I never understood why. I never understood why I had to go through that feeling of divorce or that feeling of rejection or that feeling of honestly being depressed as like a four-year-old kid and um it like grew and grew and grew like by the time I got to the third grade my eyebrows were falling out I don't know it was a weird thing I wear thick glasses now it's cool but like stress was hard 
And the beautiful thing is I never understood why I had to go through this until God put me in a place of where I am now, one, as a teacher, two, as a pastor, and three, in the capacity that I even get to do at the daycare. And one thing that I get to do is I get to walk people who are kind of going through the same things that I went through. And to be honest with you guys, the will of God is really weird and it's really confusing because sometimes he'll put you through a situation just so you can help somebody else out who is going through that same situation. And here's me in that time. Another weird thing that happened, and this has to do with Coach Will, which is why I'm just going to look at you while I say this. Um, there was a beautiful moment. So when I was just an intern here at the church, um, one of my good friends ended up passing away. And I can remember we got the news on a Wednesday that he had passed, and I showed up to church. Like I said, I was just an intern. I was sitting in the back. I was standing in the back, and like we were just worshiping, and like it was hitting me hard. Like, I was, like, dealing with so much weight and so much anger and, like, so much frustration within myself, and I didn't know why. And, like, Coach Will honestly just came up to me, and he was like, bro, you okay? And, like, for the first time in years, I cried in front of somebody. Like, I lost it. And he pulled me into another room, and he began talking to me. And we talked, and we talked, and we talked, and we ended up hitting to the reason of why I felt so much pain and so much anger, because this friend had moved away and for me, after he moved, the communication trying to, kind of stopped. And I felt like this weird thing of if I would have just talked to him more, reached out more, maybe this wouldn't have happened. And I hit that point. And while I'm having this conversation with Coach Will, we're talking, he's praying for me. And at the end of it, he tells me that because of this conversation, he was reminded of a friend who he had been distant from for a long time. And because of this conversation, he now wanted to reach out to that friend and he wanted to talk to that friend. And honestly, if God wanted to put me in a situation to where I had to go through some pain just so Coach Will could get something out of it, then who am I to tell God no? The will of God is so confusing and it's so hard, but here's what Paul tells us. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Because we live in the natural, because we live in the present, it's hard to understand God's will. It's hard to understand God's will in our life and exactly what he wants for us, but I believe the best way to get closer to God's will is exactly what Paul is telling us, and it's to change our way of thinking. If we can begin to change our way of thinking when things happen, if we can begin to change our way of thinking when bad things occur or we don't get our promises or we're stuck in the waiting room, if we can change our way of thinking towards why is God allowing this to happen? Why is God putting me through this? And what happens is when you ask that question, instead of being angry with God, when you ask a question to God, a beautiful thing happens and he starts to come a little bit more towards you because you start pursuing after him to get an answer for that question. And the beautiful thing is when you start doing that, you form this relationship with God and out of a relationship with God, the Holy Spirit and your soul solely more become one. And when we become one with the Spirit and our soul is intertwined with him, what happens is, is our will and God's will literally end up colliding. And then we start to get to pray for God's will in our life because we get a better understanding of it. You want to know why we're going through a lot of the things you're going through? Just ask him. Honestly, that's the only way to get an answer. Sometimes he'll answer you and sometimes he won't. But the question is, do you trust him enough to keep going? My simple question for you tonight, church, is this, and it's, is this Jesus stuff real to you? Is this Jesus stuff real to you? Because if it is real to you, we should be willing to sacrifice whatever it takes to get to him. If it is real to you, we shouldn't be worried about having to wait on an answer because everything he said is true and every promise he's given us we can stand on. And if this Jesus stuff is real to you, we should be able to trust him even if we don't get what we want. Listen, if I got everything I prayed for, I wouldn't be up here on the stage today. I'd be living in a mansion with a better car. Probably the same wife, though. She's beautiful. But here's the thing. 
if this Jesus stuff is real to us, honestly, we should be up at these altars every Sunday trying to give something over to him. If this Jesus stuff is real to us, like I said, we shouldn't be afraid to wait. And if this Jesus stuff is real to us, we can trust him no matter what. Trust is a crazy thing. And like we read in the beginning, in the first verse we even read, it only takes a small amount of faith and it only takes a small amount of trust too. And here's how I wanna end the service tonight, today. I'm so used to youth. Here's how I wanna end this morning. If the prayer team could come forward, I wanna give you guys a chance. And um, maybe you're in one of these three categories. Maybe this is the first time you're ever hearing anything on faith. And maybe it's the first time you wanna surrender anything to Jesus and maybe it's the first time you just want to hand your life over to him and I think here's the beautiful thing about the story of Jairus because in the first five minutes of Jairus believing he had more faith than any Christian I've seen in a long time because literally in his first five minutes he's eating the dirt at the feet of Jesus begging for him to do something and he didn't even know if Jesus could potentially actually do it yet he's only heard the stories Church, if you, with every head bowed, with every eye closed, here's what I want to do, man. If this is your first time just literally wanting to give your life over to Jesus, maybe you're in that state in your life right now where you just need to surrender everything over to him, man. And if that's you, I just simply want you to raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for.